actually going to be giving a sermon on this at uh, Loma Linda in December. Uh, I just wrote the sermon, and I haven't, I'm still working on it. I haven't even preached it yet, but it's going to be about, did you know that some people are closer to Jesus than others? And that might sound like a heretical statement, because uh, it might sound at first that Jesus loves some people more than others, but it's actually not with Jesus, it's with the person. And so by our own choice, did you know in the Desire of Ages, Ellen White says, and you can figure this out, which disciple was the closest to Jesus? He's distinguished as being the disciple whom Jesus loved. John, very good. Why is it that he is distinguished this way? And Ellen White says, because he had a more receptive spirit. And we have a clue, receptive of what? It is the message and the teachings of Jesus. He was more receptive. And so there were 12 disciples, and she says he loved them all. And then there was a closer three than the 12, Peter, James, and John. And then she says John pressed still closer, even leaning up against the breast of Jesus to hear his words and hear him teach because he wanted to be closer to Jesus. So Jesus is closer to some people than others, but it's because of the response of the person, not how Jesus is. So it's, it's our choice. The only thing that's keeping us from being closer is our own desire and thankfulness. Those who have been forgiven much are grateful for much. Those who have been forgiven little, and of course we've all been forgiven an insurmountable debt, correct? An insurmountable debt that we cannot pay, but yet only those who really appreciate that are the ones who respond with, with love and, and appreciation. Well, would you just bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer, as we study the Word of God this afternoon? Father in heaven, Lord, I want to thank you again for the privilege of, of gathering together in a, a, a safe place and have the privilege of opening up and studying your word. Lord, I want to pray as the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 18, where he said, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. So please, Lord, give us spiritual discernment. This is what the, the Laodicean church needs. They are spiritually blind, and I'm part of that church, Lord. So please open our eyes. Give us some, some things that we can learn to be closer to Jesus. This is our heart's desire in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I've got a hard job this afternoon, and that's to try to keep people awake after such a delicious meal. And so I brought something to help me with that. And I was actually going to bring this out for church, and I got so worked up because I was going late that I forgot. And so, so be careful now if you're going to fall asleep because I have an, a, uh, this is a Roman gladius. This is actually from Rome. This is a side, this is the, the actual weapon that a Roman legionary, now I remember I'm a history teacher, so this is, this is right up my alley. They would wear, um, yes, but the, uh, this is the actual size of the, the sword that they would wear, and can you think of any place in the Bible where God's word is compared to a sword? All right. All right, now this is a double-edged sword. Does the Bible anywhere? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and as sharp as a double-edged sword, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Ladies and gentlemen, did you catch that verse? The um, soul and spirit is our spiritual nature. The joints and marrow is our physical nature, and the discerner of the thoughts and intents of our heart is our mental nature. Physically, spiritually, mentally, God's word has the power to transform us. Now, there's also, when you read in Ephesians 6, it talks about the armor of God, and it talks about taking the helmet of salvation. I'm quoting from Ephesians 6, verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. What weapon does the Holy Spirit always use whenever it is, is, is helping us? It's, it's the Word of God. And so in, in, in Hebrews 4.12, it says God's Word is sharper than a two-edged sword. Now, I won't go into graphic details, but this is the kind of weapon that they would use. And the way the Roman legionary would use it, they have these large shields. And this isn't a very long sword, but since it's double-edged, its primary focus is the, the, the soldier would kind of lean in with the shield. And then when he had an opening, thrust and stab in. So it's more of a stabbing, thrusting weapon than trying to chop and, and slash. So you, could, but you can imagine, though, this could do close quarters. I mean, this is going to do some serious damage. But 
Think about now, and I use this just as an illustration, and I, if any of you want to look at this, I'll pass it around, or you can come up and see it afterwards. Uh, it's, it's just a replica. It's, it was, I think, like my, my brother-in-law was in the Navy, and he was stationed over in Italy, and he bought this in Rome uh, for me. He kind of collects swords and, and mailed it over. I think it was like $60, $70 or something, but it's not, it's not actually sharp. I mean, you, you couldn't, but it, it's heavy, though. I mean, you could still, so don't fall asleep, right? Don't fall asleep. I'm... <laughs> I'm teasing, but uh, anyway, some of you, I'll, you know what, if you get bored, I'll, if you want to look at that, you might look, and the, the, what's really fun, though, is you want to actually pull it out and just kind of like, aha, that's, that's kind of fun to do, but that's what the, the weapon was that Paul was describing, that the word of God is sharper than that, so let me tell you something, now that sword over there, it belongs to me, but does it do me any good when it's over there in somebody else's hands? It's not helping me. I mean, I have it, but I don't really have it. Does the Word of God, if, if it's over here, and say, I mean, you know, we, we're under spiritual, we understand the great controversy, amen? We are under attack at all times. My Bible isn't helping me, even though I own it, it's over there. Sometimes I need to have the Word of God, really all the time, with me. <laughs> you guys have got there playing around. Now, I'm a teacher, so watch out now, okay? I don't want you to have to stay after class and right on the board, stand in the corner. But does it make sense to you that since we're in a spiritual warfare, the, the Word of God is going to benefit us the most when we have it with us? We actually have it with us. So, yeah, it is pretty, it's pretty heavy. So, therefore, we, have a, we should really want to know and, and understand and have God's Word with us. Um, I like to start out with, and for the sake of time, I have a lot of things to to try to cover, but I like to try to just share with people. Um, I have up here two chapters. I have both of them memorized. One of them is Psalm 91. The other is 1 Corinthians 13. Did you know that Psalm 91 is a, a chapter that Ellen White said will be a descriptive of the time of trouble and is particularly important to know during the time of trouble? And so when she said that, I thought, well, I need to know it. And then she also says 1 Corinthians 13 is of so vital importance that we should read it every day and I thought, well, if I just memorize it, then I can read it every day. And so I've memorized both of them. But just since we're talking about Bible memorization, I will, uh, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to do Psalm 91. And I memorize most of my verses in the King James. You know, you can choose whichever version is, is your favorite, but I like the King James version. But wouldn't it be important if the time of trouble, which is still coming, uh, that we would know and understand these promises, that we might have them, even though I don't have my Bible in my hands right now, if I have it in my mind, then it can't be taken away from me. And I'll talk about that more too. All right, Psalm 91, verse 1, it says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Why? For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Oh dear, that's verse 13, verse 14. Um, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. I need to go back over that. I need to know that a little better. Psalm 91, 1 through 16. So anyway, if I'm going to talk to you about Bible memorization, I thought if I at least quote a few verses, that will help. And by the way, I have almost every verse we're going to go over in this presentation uh, memorized. And if you're wanting to take notes, you can relax. I will give you, I have a study guide 
that I can send you on uh, email. I can send it to you today and you can have it, all my notes. And the presentation, I can email you the presentation. I can, and the, the notes go with the presentation. It's a study questions. So does that, is that okay? I'm just telling you from the beginning. You don't, you don't have to, but if you're interested, if I get your email at the end, I'll make sure you get that. Um, maybe when I get, get home tonight and I'm back on my Wi-Fi. So the, the presentation I want to share with you today has three parts. The first part is a brief history of Bible memorization. The second part is why should I memorize the Bible? And the third part is how things that I use, this is all just kind of my own study and my own understanding of how to memorize the Bible. Does that make sense? The history, why, and how. Those are the three aspects we're going to try to look at. And to begin with, I want to tell you a quick story about a man named Howard Rutledge. He was a prisoner of war in Vietnam, and he was a, an Air Force fighter pilot. And while he was flying in a, in a, on a mission, his plane got shot down over North Vietnam. And as his plane got shot, rather, and he ejected out of the cockpit and the parachute opened up, um, he looked back at his airplane as it exploded in the air. And so he is parachuting down to the ground, and he lands in enemy territory. And, and even before he hit the ground, um, the, the North Vietnamese, they, 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 they grabbed a hold of him, and they were going to tear him apart, but someone stopped them so that they could take him off to some of the other authorities. Anyway, they took him and sent him to a famous prison called the Hanoi Hilton. And yes, the Hanoi Hilton is not a Hilton at all. It's a, it was just a place of just real hard, difficult uh, prison facilities. He spent five years in solitary confinement. Now, if you're in solitary confinement, they slide your food to you under a door. Nobody talks to you. You have nothing but what's in your mind. Now, let me just share with you briefly some of the conditions in prison. The beds were made of concrete. It was a very dark room that he was in. He wrote, he wrote it. He got out later and wrote an autobiography. It's called In the Presence of Mine Enemies. Uh, there were spiders as big as a man's fist. The cell was small and dirty. His legs were shackled with spurs that dug into your flesh, and his arms were pulled back behind his head. His face was pushed down in his own excrement. Rats as large as small cats were running around. And oh, yes, he said he was cold and completely naked. But that's not the worst thing. What could be worse? Well, what is our study about? He had neglected to learn God's word. And during this long time of nothing to do but what was in his mind, he had an intense remorse that he had not used the opportunity he had when he was younger to learn what God's word says. And now I quote him. He says, I never dreamed that I would spend almost seven years, five, in solitary confinement in a prison in North Vietnam. Or, watch this, that thinking about one memorized verse could make what bearable? The whole day. How many verses? One. One verse makes the day bearable that you can think about and meditate and grab hold of God's promises. Remember what I told you this morning about faith is based on the Word of God? And if we don't have the Word of God, then faith is, there, it doesn't exist. It's not, it, you can't exercise it. But knowing the Word of God is something that will give us strength. Now, he goes on to say, I would pray, hum him silently, quote scripture, and think about what that verse meant to me. He did know some verses. The enemy knew that the best way to break a man's resistance was to crush his spirit in a lonely cell. The former POW states, scripture and hymns might be boring to some, but it was the way we conquered our enemy and overcame the power of death around us. Let's keep singing hymns and studying the Bible. I mean, this is why this, everybody should be here today, right? I mean, now, what is interesting is that Howard Rutledge did not know the future when he was growing up. He didn't know he was going to be shot down. He didn't realize he was going to be in solitary confinement for five years. But what about us as Seventh-day Adventists? Do we understand what's going to happen in the future? Do we know a time of, of trouble is coming, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, when our Bibles iPads. I'm using an iPad to present this. I'm not against technology. I'm very much in favor of technology, and I'll talk about that later. Everything we have will be taken away from us, um, and that's you know evidence in Luke 21:12. He didn't know the future, but we, on the other hand, do know what's happening, what's going to happen, that we're going to be uh, in a time of persecution. And so, if we have not taken these opportunities now, when it's easy, quiet, simple, precious moments, and just squander them away, we're going to wish that we had studied more of the Word of God. 
And, and sadly, you know, I've only committed to really studying and memorizing Scripture for about two and a half years now. And I wish I would have started. I mean, like I said earlier this morning, I was raised by a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I, could have, I should have been starting. I mean, of course, in Sabbath school, when you're required to know verses, but I should have been knowing and studying more and more than that. Okay, we're still looking at a history. How many of you have heard of the Waldenses? The Waldenses. They actually, um, this is a, another side story. I don't really have time to tell this, but I can't help it. The, uh, the Waldenses immigrated to America and actually to a town in North Carolina about an hour from where I live. The town is called Valdez. In the French language, the, Val, uh, the Waldenses were called the Vaudois, the Vaudois people. And they lived high up in the Alps uh, in Italy. And these are the people that kept the sacred truth of the word of God during the Dark Ages. You know, the apostles, they went out and preached the gospel. The apostle Paul, we know he went to Rome, was actually executed by Nero, in Rome. Also, Peter was executed by Nero, uh, according to Christian tradition. And they were spreading the gospel. So what happened? Did you know in the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, the, the message was earnestly delivered unto the saints, which was once delivered. God has given, he doesn't have multiple sets of truth. He has given his message once, and it's the wall and sees, I believe, and especially when you read the Great Controversy, the book, The Great Controversy, they kept the truth of God in the time of the dark ages. Does the Bible talk about a time of darkness? Revelation 12, the woman, the true church, was, was given two wings like an eagle and fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared for her by God, where she might be fed and watered and taken care of. God protected his true church, and I believe it was the Waldenses during the dark ages. Well, anyway, you don't need a history lesson from me today. They proclaimed the Bible as their sole rule of faith. They were declared heretics by Pope Lucius III in AD 1184, and they were persecuted for none other than the fact that they had the word of God in its, in its truth, and they refused to give allegiance to the Pope. Though they, for those reasons, they were hated by the nations around them were under the influence of the Catholic Church, and they were persecuted, persecuted but they, they were high up in the mountains, and even though many times they, they went through, I mean, horrible atrocities. Here are many of them being burned and tortured, uh, but their motto here in Latin, lux lucid in tenebris. It means... The light shines in the darkness. And that's taken from John 1. Light shines in the darkness. And you know that's what we're called to be here in Fresno, is to be a light wherever we go, wherever our circle of influence is in the darkness of this world. And so the Waldenses knew, their, they knew the scriptures. Uh, these are just some different things I've taken from books I've read about the Waldenses. One inquisitor, you might have heard of the Inquisition, a, a papal church court to try to root out heretics. One inquisitor for the church remarked that many had memorized the entire New Testament. After a hard day's work, the Waldenses would devote the night to diligent study. It's even reported that some priests were afraid to come into contact with Waldensian children because the children knew the scriptures better than they did. And uh, the stories go that, you know, a lot of times the, the parents would have their kids memorize whole books of the Bible, like you memorize Deuteronomy, you memorize Exodus, and you can memorize Joshua. And, you, and that way, if the scriptures that they had were taken away from them, all they had to do was get the children back together. You've got Deuteronomy, you've got Joshua, you've got, and they could write them back down again. And they would keep writing them back down. And so, isn't that awesome? Of course, those of you that are parents like I am, I'm doing all that I can to encourage my child, or if you have grandchildren, to have a love of the scriptures. They are our life. They really, truly are. Jesus is the word, and the word, the message in Jesus, they're so closely connected together. And there's people today and I need to move off this point, but there's, there's, there's people in movements today that try to say that we only need Jesus, we don't need what he taught. The, the teachings of Jesus, it's just a, and that, that's a dangerous separation because you cannot really have Jesus if you don't follow and receive what his message was. They, they're so connected together, that's why Jesus is called the Word. That makes sense to me, that's why in the Bible, the Word was made flesh, the person and the message, they are inextricably connected together and you can't pull them apart. If you just want to follow Jesus without his teachings, you've just created an idol that doesn't really exist, according to Scripture. That's, I mean, anyway, I just want to caution you on that point, and I'll tell you something. Just before my dad passed away last year in April, I was talking with him about this. I said, Dad, people are saying this, and, that, you know, that you can, it doesn't matter what he taught. You just need to give yourself to Jesus, and, and, and I was just kind of just lamenting to my dad, and he gently interrupted me and said, Son, Jesus is the doctrine. Jesus is the doctrine. He is the word and the teaching. You cannot separate them. You, you cannot pull them apart and, and have truth. 
they are connected together. And so that's a dangerous thing I think Satan is trying to do today. But anyway, I'm sorry, that wasn't supposed to be uh, in my presentation. But Jesus is the... Okay, so we're moving forward from the Waldenses to John Huss. How many of you have heard of John Huss? He was... He's mentioned in the book The Great Controversy, and um, you can see here he actually was, was burned at the stake at the Council of Constance in 1415, and uh, which, by the way, you're right, that's how many years ago from where we are? 2015? Somebody, I'm not a math teacher, 600 years ago? Uh, at any rate, he was first brought, uh, he went to go defend himself there before the Emperor Sigismund and the, the Catholic Church for teaching things that they didn't agree with. And when he got there, the Emperor had given him a safe conduct pass, and the Emperor did what? The, 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 the leaders, the, the papal leaders convinced, convinced him, you don't have to keep faith with a heretic, and so they revoked his safe conduct pass, seized him, threw him in prison, and he got so weak and emaciated in prison that he almost died. They actually started feeding him again because they were afraid that he was going to die before they could put him on trial. Well, anyway, John Huss, right after he'd been in prison, he'd almost died from, from malnourishment. Over a year, in, almost a year in prison, I think, some of the people came and said, all right, we're going we're, we're gonna to bring you out and have you appear before the whole council, and you can't have anything to defend yourself. We're not going to let you have any books. And his response, now this is amazing, he said, what does it matter if they burn all the books in the world? Do I not have the entire Bible memorized, save only the book of Chronicles? Now, I want you to look up here. I put the dates of when he lived so you can see for yourself that John Huss lived to be 100. Oh, I mean, if we look at the dates here, I mean, he's not, he's not that old. He's in his 40s. I'm in my 40s. I don't have the whole Bible memorized, but Chronicles. And so what is it that they had that, that allowed them to do this? And I start asking myself this question, and like, did they have just less distractions? Maybe they had less, less distractions. But at any rate, John Huss, and of course we know that he was faithful, and according to eyewitness accounts, he was singing when he was being burned at the stake because he had the word of God in his heart. Let's move forward to our own church, John Nevins Andrews. You guys heard of Andrews, Andrews University? Uh, my brother over here went and attended Andrews University. Well, some of you may have heard that John Andrews was known as the walking Bible. He was known for being a man of the book. And in reading about him, I even discovered that there were times whenever he was in the area that, that James and Ellen White were in, they would ask him to come and pray with them and for them because his prayers were so powerful. They wanted him to be there. And could it be because he knew his Bible so well? Well, there's a story that says that, there were, that one day somebody asked him, Brother Andrews, how much of the Bible do you have memorized? You know, he never trumpeted this because he was a genuinely humble person. How much do you have memorized? And when they, they finally pushed up against him some, uh, he said, well, uh, I suppose that if the New Testament were to be entirely obliterated, I could reproduce it word for word. And then he went on to say, I'm not sure I could do that with the Old Testament, but I could probably come pretty close. Are you serious? What in the, I mean... What, these are people, they don't have TV, technology, internet. I mean, they don't have any of that. How are they able to do this and look at the dates also for how old, I mean, Andrews is. I mean, he's not, he doesn't live to be, it's not like he lived to be 120 and has spent all this time studying. Yeah, he spent a lot of time studying, but he still dies when he's a, a relatively young, young fellow, just in his 50s or so. So, a 54. I'm 41. I mean, that's just, that doesn't seem that old to me at all. And he, and he knew the word of God that well? What, what do they have? It's just a desire to receive and study the word of God. Well, let's keep moving forward. And some of you might have heard of, in fact, there's a school here out, out here in California named after this guy, HMS Richards. Anyone hear him preach in person or hear him uh, remember? Okay, so you, I, he used to come to Carolina, Carolina camp meeting back in the 70s. And I can remember as a boy when, uh, when he would come out there, Elder Richards. Well, he supposedly would read his Bible through so many times, I think he would read it two or three, four times through in just the first few months of the year. But he would be reading it so much. There's a story about him uh, near the end of his life as he was getting older and he was preaching. Um, there were some musicians on stage behind, behind him and they were watching him. And as he was preaching the sermon, they noticed that something was wrong with his Bible. And as he was preaching and turning the pages, something was wrong with his Bible. And so one of them that was sitting behind him got up the courage to kind of get up and look over and look to see what, what his Bible was doing. And, of course, they found that his Bible was upside down. And as he's flipping pages and having the audience turn and read, he's just reading it all from memory because he knew his Bible so well. 
That's pretty amazing. What did these people have? Now, I know Elder Richards lived a, maybe a longer life than some of the other people mentioned up here, but they just studied the Word of God. A love for the study of the Word of God is incredible. So, why should we memorize Bible verses? Why is it? Now, remember, I'm going to give you all my notes, so you don't have to write this down. You can. You can. Because I have, these are my own thinking, just trying to think of what are some reasons. Matthew 4, 4, thy word, I'm sorry, um, Jesus said unto them, this is Satan, he's speaking directly to Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We live just as physical food sustains us physically, it's the same in the spiritual. Our spiritual food, if we're not eating the word of God, nobody's going to skip a meal all day. I mean, we're not going to skip three meals a day probably, I mean, unless we're, we're fasting and there's a, but something important, but we're not going to do that more than one or two days and skip all meals. But do we do the same spiritually and not eat the word of God? Uh, Jeremiah 15, 16, I know I have that up. Yeah, it's further down, number four. Jeremiah says, thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Thy words were found, and I ate them. It's just a symbol for receiving them and putting them in our minds. We eat the word of God with our minds, with our eyes and ear, when we hear it, if it's a sermon, or see it when we read it. That's how we take in the information and receive the spiritual life. Jesus says, and I've got this coming up as well. I'll get to the, um, I quoted 2 Timothy 2.15 to you earlier. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Um, oh, 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 uh, Matthew 22.29. I put that under Psalm 119.11. Uh, Psalm 119.11 is, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to sin against God anymore. I mean, I, I've come to the point, did you know, I, I believe it's in Isaiah where it says, in uh, all their affliction, he himself was afflicted also. And that, I mean, he has taken, every time we sin, we're causing him pain and suffering. I mean, uh, that we crucify afresh our Savior when I do things I know I shouldn't do. But the more that I hide the word of God in my heart, it is a protection, it is a strengthening of my spiritual character to do what is right. It is so transformative. Really, my whole testimony today, I should have said, is by memorizing the word of God. It has been such a change in my life. But check out Matthew 22, 29. This is such an awesome verse. Um, I, I love this. Uh, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, and they're asking the question about, well, what if this, this woman, that she had five husbands, and what's going to happen when she gets to heaven, and who's she going to be married to, and how is this going to work out? Matthew 22, verse 29. Jesus said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. What does Jesus say their error is based on? They do not know the Scriptures. That's what he's, and since they don't know the scriptures, what else do they not know? The power of God. They don't know the power of God because they don't know the scriptures. And so all things in the scriptures are, are God is a God of order. 1 Corinthians 14, 40 says, let all things, all things be done decently and in order. Three angels' messages, there's an order. Ten commandments, there's an order. I mean, it, it's because God is, is, is orderly in his, in his operations. And we also should, should follow that, but... Error based on not knowing the scriptures. And so why do people make today so many errors in following cultural ideas? And because they do not know the scriptures and they don't know the power of God to give them victory over lifestyles that are, are damaging. Uh, let's see here. John 6, 53, 54. This is what I'm preaching on at Advent Hope. Jesus says, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Was Jesus talking to people who were alive or dead when he said that? Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus is talking to people who are physically alive but spiritually dead. Except ye eat my flesh and drink my blood. Why does he use the language of his body? It is because in John 6, verse 63, they're all connected together. He says, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. What's life? The words are life. I can't make it more simple than eating those scriptures. We receive the life of God. We receive the character and the nature of God. It, not in some kind of mystical way. I'm, please don't misunderstand. But in a genuine, real way, we receive and become, as it says, and I got up here uh, later on, 2 Peter uh, 1, verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of what? Who can finish that verse? The divine nature. We become partakers of the divine nature. How am I partaking of the divine nature? Exceeding great and precious promises. 
by those promises, I partake of the divine nature of God. And, and, and a, this is a practical, real way. We receive the character and life of Christ when we receive his word. Um, are you convinced yet? Uh, Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. John 15.7, um, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. How would you like to have more of your prayers answered? Well, notice the condition is if his words abide in us, what are our prayers going to be in, in harmony with and in accordance with his will? Not my will, but his be done. Christ himself, as a human being, said, nevertheless, not my will, but mine be done. He didn't want to drink the bitter cup of, of the, the cross. Three times he prayed the prayer, you know, Lord, if it be possible, take this cup away from me. He doesn't want to do it, but not my will, but thine be done. Because he had the word of God, he prayed according to the will of God, and God's will was for him to go through with that, and he, he did so for us. Uh, Job chapter 23, verse 12. Job says, did Job go through some hardships? Yes, he did. He says, uh, neither have I gone back from the commandment of thy lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Notice he doesn't say, I've esteemed his words more than dessert. You know, I had a good meal, but okay, I'll make a sacrifice. I'll skip dessert. No, no, no. He says, I've esteemed his words, and we're talking in a spiritual sense, more than my necessary food. Have you guys read the great controversy how Martin Luther, when he first found the Bible, do you remember that it was actually chained to the wall? It was chained to a wall in, in a library, and the first time he ever had had contact with the Bible, and he loved reading it so much, it says that he actually hated sleeping and eating because he wanted to just be reading. He, he, wanted to, he just wanted to be reading his Bible because he had never had exposure to that really growing up. He had heard bits and pieces of the Bible, and he supposed that that was all that existed. But when he came in contact with the whole Bible, and you know what Satan has done today? What he has done today, you know, in the Dark Ages and before the Reformation, the Bible was not available. But now he's made it the opposite. It's so available everywhere that it's just, oh, well, that's so commonplace. Oh, it's everywhere. You can go to the Dollar Tree and buy a Bible, 99 cents. Stacks of them. I, we actually, I, when I was in teaching in school, uh, we raised the money uh, with one of my Bible classes, and we went and bought all the Bibles they had. It was about 80, and we, we, we wrote in them and went and gave them out one day uh, to just some people that were homeless people in different shelters and stuff. And it was exciting because it was like the kids raised the money. It's like, we can buy a Bible. This is the knowledge of salvation and eternal life for a buck. I mean, but even now, now with the Internet and smartphones and smart devices, uh, I mean, you can have it everywhere, but it's become so common that it just seems like, well, no big deal. And I'm guilty of the same. I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. But it is so available, God has made his truth available if we will but hear it and receive it. You know, the Bible says, wherefore, as it is called today, while it is called today, do not harden your hearts. Hebrews 3, 7 and 8. While it is today, and today is today, it's not tomorrow. I mean, the call still goes tomorrow, but probation, my probation might end today. And so while it is today, do not harden your hearts and say, ah, I'd rather do something else. I'm too busy. Do not harden your hearts. Um, okay, 1 Peter 3.15, Romans 10.17, I quoted that at church. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15 says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be, um, always be prepared to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be prepared to give an answer. We're learning at AFCO, uh, we're learning about how to answer difficult Bible objections. And some of the things that we're, we, I have a test this Monday on six essay questions I've got to write on how would you answer somebody that says, did Jesus go to hell and preach to the spirits in prison in 1 Peter 3? I mean, that's what it says. How do you explain that? Well, what about in 2 Corinthians 5 when it says, absent from the body is present from the Lord? When you die, do you go right to heaven? That's what it sounds like. How do you answer? And so, but once you study those things carefully, it's clear, here's what I found. The more you study the Bible, the, the clearer everything becomes. When I used to see difficulties here in my own life, and I'm like, this is a tough passage, and well, well this is a tough passage, and, and this is, they begin to just vanish in the, because you see the harmony across all of Scripture. The Holy Spirit inspired all the Word of God, and there's no contradiction. The Holy Spirit is never going to contradict himself, and so if it seems contradictory, it's with my dull understanding, not what God has given and so some things we do have to dig and wrestle a little more to understand clearly, but we can, we can do so. Okay, uh, let me just uh, quote Amos 8, 11, and 12, where it says, 
there is a time coming. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. That, in the book of Amos, is a foresight foretelling of the last days. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but it will be too late at that time. After the close of probation, it will be too late. Um, and I don't want, you know, while probation still lingers today, we can do something about it. We can start making a priority to say, Lord, I'm going to spend just a few minutes at the beginning of my day and at the end of my day just thinking about a verse. And once I get one verse, then I just go to another. I mean, it, honestly, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, there's no magic trick to memorizing the Bible. It really is just consistent desire and determination to know what God's Word says. And as you just take one or two verses a day, over the course of a long time, it adds up. That's like Psalm 91. I just started trying to do one verse a day. And like 91 verse, he that dwelt in the secret place, the most high shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Oh, okay, that's just one verse. And so I just said it a bunch of times, and I thought about it. I was like, wait a second, if I'm abiding under the shadow of the Almighty, that means that I'm under his presence. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm under where he wants me to be, his control, his guidance. And so you begin to see more in the verse because you've memorized it. I, I, don't, I can't explain it to you. When you memorize things, it opens up the meaning of, of verses that you might think you know, but if you don't have it memorized, you don't really know it. I, I'm, I'm telling you, there's that much of a difference in knowing it. And just you have it, you can just pull it out, and you, you, it just is part of you. I've found that to be true. In, you just, it's, it's the same thing. It says Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. I can't taste for you, and you can't taste. What if we were to go to potluck, and we were to sit there, and people all around us are eating all this delicious food. Plates are stacked high. Like, man, that looks really good. It smells good. It sounds like it tastes good. And, but it doesn't benefit me in watching everyone around me eat unless I do what? Unless I do the same. If I'm not doing it, everyone around me can be doing it and benefiting physically from eating the food, but I must do it for myself. Even I had, I had a hard time learning this. This is, should be simple. I was raised as, you know, my dad was a pastor, you know, pastor. I mean, he was a good guy, knew, I mean, just solid with the scriptures. And so I was like, oh, you have any questions? Ask dad, dad knows, oh, dad, 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 whatever. But I wasn't tasting for myself. God becomes real when you taste for yourself. It's, it really is that simple. It, it helps to have good influences around us, but we must for ourselves be searching the scriptures. And it, it, it transformed me. When I started just studying our fundamental beliefs, and because I had studied the 2300-day prophecy and believed it because I had studied it, I had studied the state of the dead, I had stu and when I believed it because I had studied it, my beliefs became mine and not just my churches or my parents. They were my beliefs because I had studied them. And so when you have ownership of something, you, you value it differently than if it's just something you just know about because you, you actually own it. Okay, well, what about when should we study the Bible? Uh, this is just a simple little question. I just, I'm using the Bible to answer all these, um, these questions. When should we study the Bible? Joshua 1 verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein, how often? Day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Thou shalt meditate day and night. All right, well, we really covered everything right there with that one verse. So is there any time that I shouldn't be thinking about the Word of God? Well, let's go to another person. Joshua, what about Moses, Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9? This is Moses now. How many of you know what's in Deuteronomy chapter 5? Does anybody know what is found in Deuteronomy chapter 5, right before Deuteronomy 6? There is a, the Ten Commandments is correct. They are repeated. In fact, how many of you know what the word Deuteronomy means? Do you, know what the, do you guys know what the, the first four letters are? Duet. A duet is how many people? Two. And namos is the word for law. So Deuteronomy just means second law giving. That's all the book. It's, it's a second repeating of the law. Moses, after just repeating the law in Deuteronomy 5, in verse 6 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Uh, I'm sorry, that's what I just quoted. I'm sorry. He says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them, watch this, parents, diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. 
four things right there. When you're sitting in your house, when you're getting up, when you lie down, when you rise, I mean, I'm sorry, when you're sitting down and when you're walking and when you're sleeping and when you're waking up or when you go to lay down and sleep. Um, so therefore, I mean, we have in those verses morning and evening worship right there, morning and evening, and even when we're sitting in our homes and when we're out walking in the fields or walking, doing our, our, our whatever we're doing, labor, work together, hey, son, you know, God is good and he has given us a, a, a wonderful law, the law of liberty, James says, to guide us in all our ways. And so my son, is, we've, we've memorized the, the Ten Commandments with him, the three angels' messages with him, Psalm 91 with him, uh, Psalm 100 with him, Psalm 103 with him. So, uh, he has about 100 memory verses or so, and uh, we're still, but we wish we'd have started sooner. I mean, he's already 16, and I can see how in just a few years he's going to be, he's going to be on his own, and you want to instill all these, these truths in his mind that, that he will have. Uh, what about Psalm 1, 1 and 2? So we've got Joshua and Moses, and who wrote most of the Psalms? David. What does David say? Um, Psalm 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the scornful, nor sitteth in the way of the sinners. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate how often? Day and night. Day and night. Joshua, day and night. Moses, lie down, rise up, walk, sit down. These words, diligently teach them to your children. Not haphazardly, but diligently. And that's a rebuke to me. I wish I would have done a better job as a parent when my son was younger in being diligent about that. The message was there in the Bible for me to read. I just was not reading it and and memorizing it carefully. Well, anyway, uh, the rest of these um, also speak on that as well. So it's the same principle. Morning, evening, day and night, all the time. Well, let's go to now what might be of most interest. Now, I'll give you a disclaimer. These are all things that I use, and I don't expect you to follow all of these, but if there's one or two tips that can be useful for you, then, then, then use it. That's, that's the, the goal. If there's one or two things you can say, this will be useful. I'm going to try to help incorporate this in my own life. I pray that will be the, the case for you. All right, number one, of course, is pray. Don't overlook the simple things. Pray and ask for God to strengthen your mind to know his word. It says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, um, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are what? Spiritually discerned. If the spiritual nature of the Word of God, it must be the Holy Spirit impacting and guiding my mind to receive correctly what it says. Uh, independent of the, the Holy Spirit, there are people that have read the Bible many times through, but they never gain and have a transformed life by it. We must have the, the operation of the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he shall guide you into some truth. All truth, amen. He shall not speak of himself, because he's always referring to the word, and he shall show you what is yet to come. I mean, the Holy Spirit is going to guide and lead us. We need the Holy Spirit. Uh, number, number two up here. They're not in any specific order. They're just kind of a scattered thing of tips and ideas. Time, make it a daily priority. Look for extra minutes each day, waited or squandered, doing nothing. You'd be surprised if you just try to think about some time that you are just doing little things or no, no big, I mean, just look for time that you can find to use extra, just five, ten minutes here or there. You'd be amazed if you start looking at your time, how you can find uh, things that you could be spending memorizing the Word of God. Now, this might seem obvious, but study the passage carefully. Would you believe that as you're studying a passage, you begin to, you, you obviously begin to remember it better? Let me give you an example of this. How simple is Psalm 119, 105? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We all know that. That's an easy one, right? There's nothing, you can't get anything more out of that verse, right? It's so simple. I mean, it's just, it's easy. But wait a minute. If you really are studying it, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Well, my feet right here where I'm standing, that's, that's present. And a light unto my path, that's where I need to go. That's the future. God's word shows me where I'm at right now, my condition and my needs right now, and it shows me where I need to go for the future. Like, just a simple verse. Did you know there's a statement in the Spirit of Prophecy where Ellen White says that no one understands the full meaning in even one verse of the Bible? The depth is there. It's just up to us to have an interest and a desire to want to dig and study and, and, and find out these things. It is there, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you. Um, all right, uh, technology. 
Yes, uh, technology, iPad, things that, that Andrews and John Huss and the Wallaces did not have, um, iPads, tablets, smartphones. Um, I use an app on my phone and on my iPad. It syncs across devices called Scripture Typer. And it keeps track of, I have all my memory verses on here, and it reminds me every day I set a time to, to remind me to review. If I haven't spent time reviewing, and I usually try to do that in the morning and in the evening, but if I somehow get so busy that I haven't done it when I... I get a notification that says it's time to review. And it's so, it, it makes it so much e Put technology to work on your side as a reminder. And uh, this, this scripture typer, the way that it's set up, you know, as a teacher, I understand we all have different learning styles. Some of you are probably left-brained. Some of you are probably right-brained. Some of you probably are hands-on. Some of you are probably auditory. Some of you are probably visual. I, 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 the, the way this works here, this application, is you actually type out the verses of the Bible as you're reviewing them. And as you type it, um, if you get a word wrong, or then, of course, it, you get a, it, the word turns red. And so you, it then shows up when you go back to type it again as a highlighted box when you get to it that you need to work this word you missed. And so this app used to be like $3.99. And they updated it a little while ago. I think it's seven or eight ninety nine. It might even be nine ninety nine. But you might have to wait till after the Sabbath to, to, to buy it. But if you're going to use it a lot, highly recommended. I like it because I'm actually interacting with the. Ver can I can I show it to you real quick on my iPad? Are you interested in that? I don't I don't want to waste your time because not everybody's technology, and that's that's fine. I have I deal with some people when I talk with them. They really like the flashcards. Um, and a, a one lady when I, I gave this presentation. She was telling me, and I actually have it here in my jacket. I think I was wearing the same suit when I... She uses uh, these... This is just a plastic uh, little... It's a note card holder, or a business card holder. And she uses, uh, like, business card size uh, pieces of paper, and then she will just write out memory verses on there, and she'll stuff them in there, like, more than one or two, and she'll just carry this, I think, in her purse or in her pocket. And so, just like when I would pull out my phone and I would start to type on a, a memory verse, she'll pull this out, and just go through and then pull the cards and look at them. And that's great. I mean, the, the main thing is that you, you're doing something. But I'll show you on uh, really quickly here what I use. And it is, uh, let's see, where is that at right here? All right, it's called uh, Scripture Typer. And all right, this is, you know what, it is not, it's actually showing that it hasn't synchronized with the, I think I have all my verses up to date, but it's, sh it's actually showing that I have some over here on the side. It shows some of the verses. It shows how many days they're, 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 they're past due, but it's not synch it hasn't synchronized with my phone yet uh, for some reason. It needs to. Anyway, I, I caught them all up yesterday uh, evening um, right after uh, on my way here. All right, well, let, let me just show you really quickly what, uh, what you'll do here. For example, like I have a memory, like these are all my memory verses that I have in here. And I have uh, a little over 800. And so we'll just take an easy one. All right, I'm going to click on, I'm going to show you how this works. And you, there's different ways of learning and how you start out. Um, like you start out like with typing it. Uh, this is the first level. And so you see there's a keyboard at the bottom. You can watch me typing. The, finger, the, the, the keyboard will show up. But I'm just going to type. I can look at it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And what's good about this is you also have to type the reference because I want to be able to tell people right where that is. I mean, of course, the most important part is to know the message, but I want to be able to know this helps me. My wife used to use a different app for memorizing, but she didn't have to know the reference. And so she got, after a while, she has over 300 memory verses. She got to where she was like, I, I know it's in Isaiah. I know it's in Romans. And so, but I was like, you've got to be able to tell people chapter verse. I mean, that's, you want to know so you can share it. I mean, bang, you've got it. And so she switched over to this, and she's finally come along with, okay, so Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Now, here's the next step. If you are, so if you're learning a verse, now it takes away every other word. This is the next stage as you're practicing. And we all know this, so it's easy. But if you didn't know it, you're starting out. So now I have to fill in in, and then it has the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And I, see, I have to know, where's that found? Where's that? Okay, it's Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. And then the next and final step is the, uh, okay, is the, uh, the, the mastery level. And here is where there's nothing there, but you see it says Genesis 1.1 1, 1 at the top. 
But watch that start to fade out as I'm typing, because when you get to the end when you have to type the reference, you have to still know it. So this is still an easy verse, so it's just a simple example. So now I'm typing this all together. Now I'm going to type a word wrong, and you'll see it show up in red. In the, and I'll say, in the end. Oops, it turned it, well, you guys, I don't know if you can see it or not. I typed it wrong. In the beginning, God, and I'll type it right, created the heaven. Now do you see how the top part, it went away, Genesis 1.1? So by the time I get to typing that in, I have to still remember it. I started out knowing this is what I'm typing, but as you're typing the verse and you start thinking about the verse, it's just to prompt you to remember where it's found. Created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1.1. Now, do you see how I missed that one word? When I go back to it, do you see how there's a blank there? Do you see, or do you see that the, right there? I missed that word. And so that shows me when I come back to study it again, I need to try to remember what was it that I missed. What was it, what was it? And it helps you just to try to think about. So if I'm typing here in the, what was that word? And it, you can see that it's a longer word. It's like, what was it? What was it? And of course, we know what it was. Beginning, it's, it's just to help you study. It's just to help you study. And this works for me because, you know, if I just have flashcards, I'll be honest, I start to zone out and I, my mind can wander. But when I'm typing something, it helps you to be able to I'm, I'm almost like I'm, I'm interacting with the verse, and my mind stays focused on word to word how it comes out. That's what works for me. And so, you know, I don't know if that will be helpful for you, but those of you that are inclined towards uh, technology, uh, let me just show you something too up here. This is kind of neat. They have a this uh, with this app here. They keep track of statistics here, and this is kind of interesting. It shows you a list of the people and how many verses they have everyone that's using the app. I am number 181. I have 838 memory verses out of, and they have a list of 2,500 people. But now watch, look, look who's ahead of me. Now look who's ahead of me. Now look at the numbers on the, the oh, it's actually too bad because they, they haven't updated this app when the new iOS came out, but I'm going to go all the way to the very top up here. Uh, there's a person up there with, their name is Memory Works. They have 12,000 memory verses. And in case you're curious, does anyone know how many verses there are in the whole Bible? I'm a curious person. 31,102. So I only know 838. How many of you, that's around 3% or so, how many of you would be comfortable with a doctor operating on you that knew 3% of the book they were supposed to know in order to give surgery or to do their job? Maybe you should study it a little bit more. I mean, I'm, I'm using that as an illustration. You only know 3%? That's all? I mean... That's, you would, you, in most areas, we would say, that's a failing grade. You get 55% is a failing grade. You should know 60% is a D. And so 100%, I'm on a mission, brothers and sisters. It's going to take me a while, but um, I'm just kind of, I'll add one or two verses a day. And I started two and a half years ago. And if you do the math, it's less than one verse a day. Because, you know, especially since I've been at AFCO, I've been so busy and I haven't been able to spend as much time. But this is something I'm dedicated to. And if it's useful or helpful for you guys, Use technology. One of the other good things about this is um, you can record your voice, and um, I don't know if this will be bad or not. I'll actually just uh, play this for you, and I don't know if you'll be able to hear it or not, but it actually is something that I can use. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1.1. And God said, let us make man in our image. This is my next memory verse in the sequence. It's playing through all my memory verses. Over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over every creeping thing that creeps the earth. And over all these, and over every creeping thing that creeps Anyway, I listen to this when I'm walking or jogging, riding my bike every day. When I'm walking our dog, I put in my earbuds, and people might think I'm listening to music or something. I'm listening to memory verses. When I'm driving my car, I think it's illegal in California to drive with earphones, but I was breaking the law last night. I was listening to my memory verses. And it takes me to listen to my memory verses over three hours just to listen to them. If, but here's one of the other features they have. It has, you can adjust the playback rate to speed up faster so that you can actually hear them and practice saying it quicker so it, it jogs your mind faster. Now, this is going to sound funny, but, one through three. all right, and, I will put empathy between thee and, the woman. and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel, Genesis 3.15, and let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell, that's an easy one, Exodus 25.8, and, 
and proclaim, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means forgive the guilty. Please, of the fathers upon the children unto the third or fourth generation of them that hate me. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Do you see what's happening? I'm having to say it faster to keep up with the, the recording, and it only prompts my mind to know it faster. Does that, does that make sense to you? And, and I know this might be overload for some of you, but if my son gets a kick out of it, because when we're driving down the road sometimes, I'll put it on the fastest speed, and you can't even talk that fast, but I try to say my verses that fast. And he thinks it's hilarious because I'm trying to keep up and say it. And sometimes I can do pretty good. Because the verses that I have, I want to know what I know. Does that make sense to you? I'm slow to add verses without reviewing because I want to know what I know. And so these that I've added, I'm like, I want to know these. I'm going to keep study, 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 study. And so I review a lot. But I have taught you statutes and judgments. Even all right, I'm know. sorry. I wasn't planning to do all that. That's, that's, we're, I'm taking a long time here. Let me go through uh, just a few more slides and... Uh, thank you for your patience. If anyone needs to go to the bathroom and get a drink, then uh, please uh, feel free to do so. So technology, and this other point up here, audio, you can do two things at once, driving, exercising, cleaning. Because, you know, I want to exercise. I, I mean, it's good to be healthy. I mean, I try to jog, and, and uh, yesterday before coming here, uh, I'd been doing so much sitting and studying all day, I said, I've got to go jog for 30 minutes before I get in the car. Jog, hit the showers. I'm sorry, that's, why, that's another reason I was later getting here. Uh, Brother Joe, I, I, I went jogging for 30 minutes before I left, and then I got all the traffic coming out of Sacramento coming down here. But as I was, it's, it's listening to the Word of God, because, you know, when I was little, we didn't have smartphones and, and things where you could just play. I mean, we had uh, CD players, but those skip, and they're really huge, and you can't carry that along, and it's skipping, and you can't hear anything. But now with everything digital on, on the way that it's recorded, there's no skipping. I can run and balance. I can be breathing heavy, and it's just you can still hear your verses. And so what I tell people is if you see me and it looks like I'm texting somebody, I'm typing my memory verses. 95% of the time, I don't have that many friends. I mean, I, I have a lot of friends, but I'm, I'm texting people. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm doing memory verses. It, it looks like I'm texting, but I'm using that app. And it's been a huge, huge uh, blessing. Okay, commitment. I know that some of these are connected. Time and commitment are, co are connected. But even if you make the time, if you're not committed, then you might not follow through. I mean, you have to make it a commitment. Don't allow anything else to crowd out your time. Next slide. Consistency. Um, cultivate a habit that will grow stronger and stronger each day. Some of you understand as you make habits and patterns, they actually become more and more simple and easier. It is, it's, it's a huge, important thing. Consistency is huge. Something else that helps me, read out loud or write or type the Bible verse. Now, I just showed you about speaking out loud when I'm listening to it, since I can use that app and record or type. Um, did you know, have you guys read in Christ's Object Lessons, uh, the parable of the talents, that Ellen White actually says that this, the power of speech is a talent and that men are influenced by their own words? Did you realize that? If you're around people and they're constantly depressed and talking about how terrible things are, they are oftentimes, I feel bad, oh, I feel bad. I mean, they, they, it's self-fulfilling. But if you talk faith and if you talk confidence, I mean, you don't want to be fake about it, but then that's what you will have. It flows out from what your, your own attitude is. We're influenced by our own words. Here's the point. If I'm saying the word of God, it will influence me. And so even today, as I was preaching to you guys, I find my own faith encouraged as I'm quoting verses to you because there is a power in the word of God. And when you have that with you, I'm not looking like power, like so much physical power. It's a spiritual changing, it's just life-changing power. And so when you say it out loud, that will help. This is something else that's really been helpful to me. When I read a verse that's like really cool, um, I, I share it with like, do you have, I hope all of you have spiritually minded family and friends. Like if you read a verse that's like really good and, and you're like, I want to memorize that. That's how my wife and I were like, she'll read something like, oh, I'm memorizing this. And I'll read something, I'm memorizing that. And we'll be comparing and talking about this. I, I like this verse because it says this and it just really grabs me. Um, so when you share the verse, it also makes another impression on your mind. Like recently I was reading uh, Psalms, and I read Psalm 1611, um, and it says there, um, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. But the phrase, in thy presence, the presence of God, is fullness of joy. It just, it just grabbed me. 
And so I, I had to start sharing that with all my, my friends and stuff. I was texting them, like, check out this verse, Psalm 1611. And I would just, I would, I'd type it out and send it to them. Check out this verse. And another friend, like, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. But, I mean, it was so exciting to me that as I was sharing it, it's also being made even deeper on my mind. And I'll just, you guys are my friends now, right? This week I was reading Psalm 50, and it's verse 3. And I don't have this memorized yet, but it just says, Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. And it was just, and the rest of it goes on, the fire burns from before him and so on. But our God shall come. Yes, the, the hope of our, our expectations, he is going to come. And he's not just going to be quiet. You know, faith is believing in what you cannot see. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, is what faith is defined in Hebrews 11.1. 1. But he shall come and not keep silence. And that just, in thinking of that, it just, I get stirred in my soul to, to, to just be revived and excited to think of that verse. So as I share that with people, it also is something that I begin to remember. So when you learn something great anyway, you can't keep it to yourself, right? We're studying the prophet Jeremiah, and he went through all kinds of persecution and said in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, even after he was being persecuted, thrown into a pit in a well, he says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, referring to God, nor speak any more in his name. But then he says, But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not hold it in. That's his response to having the word of God. He was a burning fire in his heart, that's our desires, and it was shut up in my bones. You know, your bones are your skeletal base core structure. All of us are composed, our skeletal basic structure are bones, and if it's shut up in your very bones, that's who you are. And actually, when I was thinking about that verse this week, because I was also thinking about another verse, on Hebrews 4.12, I saw a connection where it, when I was telling you guys about the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing a soul of joints and marrow, the joints and marrow is your bones. And so Jeremiah had the experience of Hebrews 4.12. The word of God was living and active, and it was actually even physically in his bone. I mean, it was changing him. It, the word of God, it's a total transformation. It's that powerful. So, all right, I'm, I'm taking too much time. All right, uh, visibility, note cards, post it wherever you can. Um, like, I, uh, like I said, I have... Um, I use, uh, like for my screensaver and stuff on my phone, I'll, try to put, I'll put up memory verses so that every time I get into my phone, I'm reminded of a particular verse. And once I start to get the hang of it, then I'll switch out and put another one in. And so you're, as many times as you can just find to put it where you're going to see it, make that, I mean, it's just simple, but I think it's something that makes it more visible. Um, personal application, yes, think of how the verse applies to you. And like personally, what does God want me to know with our God shall come and shall not keep silence? He wants Brian Heinemann to know that he is coming soon and that he is going to speak forth his truth and we shall see him as he is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 um, says, When Jesus comes, we shall be like him. Be like Jesus. This is my song. In the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. That's 1 John 3, 2. That whole verse is what that song is based on. And then review. I have found that I, when I first started memorizing, I could add a lot of verses quickly, but now that I've gotten quite a few, at least for me, I have to spend a lot more time reviewing so that I don't forget the ones I know and then waiting to, to move on for other ones. Okay, um, I have a few quotes here to close out from the Spirit of Prophecy that are awesome. We've seen the Bible. We've seen some verses that talk about the importance of memorizing Scripture and having it hidden away. And now let's look at the Spirit of Prophecy. Ellen White says, several times each day. How often? Several times each week. Several times each day. Precious golden moments should be consecrated to prayer and the study of the scriptures. If it is only to what? Commit a text to memory. What does she call these golden moments? That spiritual life may exist in the soul. You know what? Um, Ellen White quotes 1 Timothy 5, verse 6 in Christ's Object Lessons and says that separated from God, existence may be ours for a little while, but we do not possess life. First Timothy verse five, chapter five, verse six says, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. How can you be dead while you live? Spiritually dead, physically alive. Ellen White describes that as existence. I'm existing, but I do not possess life. And so life comes from every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. 
We know these things as, as believers, but we don't treasure and value. And I'm speaking to myself. I'm speaking here to me more than any of you in here that I would be faithful in wanting to truly have spiritual life. What about Christ's example? It says here, um, this is from Review and Herald, April 10. By the way, all these quotes I will give to you. Build a wall of scriptures around you, and you will see that the world cannot break it down. Commit the scriptures to memory. Is that plain? I mean, inspire testimony, commit the scriptures to memory, and then throw right back upon Satan when he comes with his temptations. It is written. It is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 4.10. Him only shalt thou serve. And I have sadly not always served God only. I've served myself and served the world. This is the way that our Lord met the temptations of Satan and resisted them. He met and resisted them with, it is written. Um, all right. Next statement. Uh, this is Review and Herald, April 27, 1905, paragraph 13. Keep a pocket Bible with you as you work and improve every opportunity to commit to memory its precious promises. Now, I snuck in the last part of here, or smartphone. Is he doing the writing before? I hope the danger with this, though, is that you can get distracted with other things and so... It takes self-will and discipline, but a pocket Bible. And I, have, I actually have some just like that that I take uh, with me uh, in my, my backpack out in the car. And when I go camping with my son, because I, mean, I, don't, I don't take my nice church Bible, but I take those, those little Gideon Bibles. And so even when my, I'm camping out in the woods with my son, and we still have worship in the morning and the evening, and pull out those little Bibles. So how valuable is the Word of God? Check out this statement. Hang in memory's hall the precious words of Christ. They are to be valued far above silver or gold. Is it the world all caught up in what is the price of gold? What is the value? What is the, what's the current rate for gold now? Economic stability and economic security. Sorry, not stability, security. I have security. The word of God is what we need to have that's far more valuable than any earthly riches or wealth. It is the word of God. So, and how, hasn't God made that available to everyone on earth? I mean, every, I mean, rich, poor, middle class, upper class, lower class, he has made his word available that all might have a knowledge of, of truth. Awesome. That's volume six of the Testimonies, page 81, paragraph three. Check out this statement. No one can take it from us. The time may come when many will be, the time might come. All right, I know some of you, I'm taking a long time, but this is so important. The time will come when many will be deprived of the written word. But if this word is printed in the memory, who can take it from us? No one can take it from us. Just like Howard Rutledge, when he didn't know he was going to be shot down in the airplane and be stuck in prison, you have nothing to think about but what's in your mind. You've got no remote controls, no devices, no nothing. And if I could just go through and know the word of God, those are, that's what our faith is based on. And we will have a living, true experience that we can hold on to our Savior and prove that we really do love him. If a man love me, he will keep my words, John 14, 23. If, man, I'm sorry, that is a volume 20, manuscript release. Uh, manuscript release, 20 MR, 64, uh, paragraph 4. 20 manuscript release. And I just put a picture over here of a dungeon, and hopefully none of us will have to be in a dungeon like that, but a, a, a windowless dungeon room there that, um, well, now I want to give you guys some encouragement too. Uh, we have just a few more slides, a couple more. Simple, earnest faith. This isn't directly re given, uh, relate, um, talking about memorizing the Bible, but this is, I think it applies. This is actually taken from Christ's Object Lessons, page 59, paragraph 3. A knowledge of the truth Depends upon how high your IQ is. Depends upon if you went to an Ivy League school. De All right, this is encouraging. I'm a simple person. I'm not that smart. You know, I, I'm just a simple person. A knowledge of the truth depends not so much upon strength of intellect as upon pureness of purpose. Can we all have that? Yes. The simplicity of an earnest, dependent faith. Can we all have that? No matter if we do have a high IQ or not. Yes, we can all have that. A knowledge of the truth depends upon a simple, childlike, pureness of heart, desire to know the truth. To those who, in humility of heart, seek for divine guidance 
angels of God draw near. The Holy Spirit is given to open to them the rich treasures of the truth. So I just like this because, you know, sometimes I might be intimidated to think, well, I just, I don't know as much as these other, you know, high theology doctors and all these other seminary professors and high, I don't really, but what God cares about is a simple, earnest desire to know him. And that's what will be rewarded in studying his word. He will, he doesn't care if you're, whatever your background or your, your intelligence is, he does not care. And two more slides. We, this is from last day events. We shall have to stand before magistrates to answer for our allegiance to the law of God, to make known the reasons of our faith. And the youth should understand these things. I put this together to share with, uh, with young people as well. And my young people are precious to me. I believe our young people are our greatest resource and our greatest gift that God has given to the church. I mean, Jesus is, of course, the greatest gift, but that he himself has given to us, it is our young people. We should make every effort to come near and encourage them and, and, and rather than criticizing and rebuking them as much, be encouraging them to, to follow and trust in God. They should know the things that will come to pass before the closing up of the world's history. These things concern our, what were welfare? Eternal welfare, and this is a rebuke to me, teachers, that's me, and students should give more attention to them. Less attention, more attention to them. Uh, so it is very, very serious. And, and I have this closing appeal. I'm actually going to skip over that for the sake of time. And I wanted to share with you some good news. This is my last slide. So finally, I'm, I'm at the very end. Thank you for your very extreme patience. I thought, you know, we talked about this. What are some simple, powerful verses I can share with you? By the way, this will also be on your study guide. I'll give these to you. They're, they'll be on the list. These are some simple verses that mean so much to me and that are just power-packed with truth that you could, you could probably memorize all 10 of these today, tonight. You know, when it used to be on Saturday night, I couldn't wait to go home as soon as the sun went down and turn on the TV. Now, whether the sun goes down, Vespers, Vespers runs all the way till I go to bed. I want to study the Word of God. I want to know more and more and, and, and be transformed more and more by that. Um, uh, we've, we've, we've talked about this one. We've, uh, Isaiah 26, 3, I quoted that one earlier. Perfect peace, whose mind has stayed on thee. Word of God, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's all that is. Can you imagine if you have that in your mind and you know where it's found, and that's the story of Zacchaeus. Come down, you know, from going to your house today, for this day salvation has come to this household, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. And guess what? I was one of those that was lost. All of us are. And so, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. Wow, that's very simple. I mean, this was my testimony this morning. If any man be in Christ or woman, he is a new creature. All things are become new, not some, a complete change. I must tell you something about this verse. Philippians 1.21, Ellen White says this verse is the shortest, simplest definition of what it means to be a Christian in the entire Bible. The short, you know, I'll, I'll quote it for you. You can look it up too. Um, this is the simplest, shortest definition. You can have longer definitions that are true, but this is the most compact. And so I've actually started trying to use this as my email signature. It says, Philippians 1.21, Paul writes, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What? Where, where? To live is Christ. My living is all to be through Christ, for Christ, and by Christ, and to die to myself is gain. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. I can show you the quote um, where she says, this is the simplest definition of what it means to be a Christian in the entire Bible. One verse. So why not memorize it? And then I have that with me. I want to die to myself and live for Christ. Um, the importance of studying Revelation. Um, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is far off. Was, for the time is at hand. The time is near. Blessed is the person who reads and hears the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written therein because the time is near. And then finally, I, 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 I was just going to have 10 and I couldn't help. This is my favorite verse. Can I share my favorite verse with you guys? You might not care. I like to memorize people's favorite verses. If you, if you want to get me excited at the door, tell me your favorite Bible verse because that way I make a connection. And like Pastor Doug said, his favorite Bible verse is Jeremiah 29, 13. He says, if I had a nickel for every time I wrote that down on some signed it somewhere, he said, I, I probably be rich in an island somewhere. Anyway, he was he, to our class. He teaches us every Thursday. Uh, but he's, and of course, that's, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. He, 
And so just knowing that's his favorite verse, it's like, oh, man, that's really cool. And so it just reminds me that this verse really touches that person. Isaiah 45, verse 22. Does anybody know that? It says, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I love that verse. It says, look unto me. Did you know, and I'm not an expert in, in words and stuff, but the Old Testament written in Hebrew, the word look actually means in the Hebrew, turn. So what does that mean I'm doing before I'm actually over here? And it really says, turn unto me and be ye saved. And who is this message to? All the ends of the earth. Does that include every nation, kindred, tongue, and people? That's the first angel's message. It's everyone and be ye saved. The results of looking to Jesus and it's he, because he is God. Not Michael Jordan, not a politician, not a movie star. I am God, and there is none else. And so I love, I, every time I even say that verse, it just, it, it, it touches my heart and convicts me of my love for my Savior. So I want to thank you guys for your, your time this evening, or afternoon, and it's evening by now. But does anyone have any questions, maybe, um, at all? If there's anything I can do to encourage you? Thank you so much. I really apologize. And boy, it was supposed to be an hour, and it went an hour and a half. So, it was worth it. Amen. Amen. Are you encouraged? Are you excited? I will. If you give me your email, I can send you. I have a study guide. It has all my verses, and, and it, on one, it's front and back, one piece of paper, and I can send that to you as soon as, as soon as I get back home tonight, and you'll have it by tomorrow. I don't know how late I'll get home or not, but. But it's so important to me, and so if people are interested, I want to give it. I want to share it. And if you want the presentation, I can send you a link where you can download the keynote, and you can have the slides with the study guide. I mean, either one is, if you want both, just let me know. But any other questions, I'll close with prayer if, if anyone doesn't have any questions. Um, thank you, brothers and sisters. I'm so sorry. It's, I'm gone so long. Yes. Yes, ma'am. So the, remembering the first three words, and then that helps trigger the rest of the verse. A lot of times, that's the, those are, you're right. That's actually, if I can get a verse, sometimes you'll see me, I'll pause, and I'll try to remember how does it start. I can remember the, the rest of it. A lot of verses start with and. And so then, it, then it, it's not, if it's distinctive, then, uh, oh, you know what? I'm tempted to quote to you guys one of my, another. You know, th this is how awesome the, the Word of God is. Let me quote Revelation 15, 2 through 4, because... I like to, I memorize this just because it's powerful to me. And Revelation 15 is a description of the 144,000. And it says there, and after these things I saw a great, no, hold on a second. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Now, notice this song is so powerful. Saying, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Revelation 15, 2 through 4. Can you see why? I mean, I was just like, that's powerful as I'm reading it. And I just thought, I want to know that so I can just say it. And just in being able to say it and have it, it, it strengthens me. It strengthens me to say, thou only art holy. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. And so, I mean, that's who he is, holy God. Okay, Th thank, you, thank you again. Thank you again so much. And maybe I'll just get a piece of paper and I'll just get everyone's. Oh, you already have that? Okay, they have a piece of paper? You guys are passing around? Okay, thank you. Okay, so if you don't mind, I'm sorry. And now that way, I'll just have them all together. Any other questions, just feel free to see me afterwards. And let's just close with prayer. Thank you again. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for giving us your word. Um, this is our very life. It is what our faith is built on. Uh, nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And the only way we can know about Jesus is through his word. So it only makes sense that we would receive the message that you have given to us, each one of us. The servant of the Lord says we should read the word of God as if you are speaking to each one of us personally. Yes, you are a personal God. Help us to recognize the Bible is for us personally and not just other people. 
and you desire to change and transform all of our lives. Lord, I believe the answer to every problem that any human being ever would face is found in your word based on the principles and the divine instruction and counsel given there. So may we search as for hid treasure and find the treasure uh, that you would have for us. May we be diligent and may we be faithful. And please grant us your Holy Spirit to, to continue to convict us and draw us to, to follow through on this important, important thing. Uh, please bless my brothers and sisters and uh, keep us all safe together. And may we be saved when you come back very soon. May we be ready and longing and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. This is our king and he will save us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.